introduction. I don't know about the low stress part. <laughs> Although my trip here in Israel has been low stress, it's been wonderful. And uh, particularly to share ideas uh, for you, Mr. President, and the Prime Minister and other uh, very gracious uh, people here. Uh, my wife, Sonia, is here, and uh, we, we uh, really enjoyed this return trip. And I won't, I'll try to avoid repeating what I said uh, yesterday at the opening, uh, since many of you probably were there. But I will say, in terms of the future being startling, I didn't start with an idea of uh, very dramatic changes in the future and then work backwards and try to justify them. My interest in the future stemmed from a really practical concern. I decided I wanted to be in bed when I was five years old. And I remember the feeling I had, because my parents gave me all these enrichment toys and record sets, and I felt like if I could put these parts together in just the right way, I could create transcendent effects. I didn't have that vocabulary when I was five years old. But I remember the feeling. And I discovered the computer when I was 12. There were only 12 computers in all of New York City at that time. I quickly realized that the key to being successful was timing. And that most inventors get their gadgets to work and most fail because the timing is wrong, not all the enabling factors are placed where they need to be there. Larry Page and Sergey Brin had a great idea for search engines. They did it at exactly the right time. And you need to create your inventions, and this is true not just for technology inventions, You're creating a new type of school, a new social program, a new form of music. Your project needs to make sense for the world that will exist when you finish the project. And if you don't think the world will change dramatically in two or three years, look back two or three years. Most people didn't use social networks, wikis, blogs, let alone tweets. If you look how much the world has changed in just a few years' time. Think back one decade, most people didn't use search engines. Imagine life without search engines, without the web. That was only about a decade ago. And the pace of change is getting faster and faster. That's one of the things I'll talk about to try to share some ideas why that is the case. But Creating intellectual work today, particularly if it's technology, is really the catch of moving train. You need to beat the train when you get there, and it's going to be a very different place. So about 30 years ago, I began to study technology trends. And being an engineer, I gathered a lot of data to, in many different fields, and trying to ascertain, is there some way we can anticipate where technology will be? And I didn't expect there would be an easy answer, but I felt if you had a lot of data, maybe I could step back and squint and I'd see some pattern of, amidst all the chaos. But innovation should be the most difficult thing to anticipate because it involves human creativity and competition and interact countries dumping products in another and IPOs, and bankruptcies, and marketing programs, and you would think that would be very unpredictable. And I made a rather surprising discovery continues to surprise me 30 years later, I've been tracking this uh, now for 30 years, that if you measure, as I said yesterday, the underlying properties of information technology in many different ways, in many different fields, they follow amazingly predictable trajectories. Uh, if you were to ask me what will the cost of a virtual computing be in 2016 or the spatial resolution of brain scanning in 2018 or the number of bits we're going to send out to the internet in 2019. I can give you a figure. It's likely to be accurate because, this, and I'll show you a few dozen examples of this, of how predictable those trajectories are. <coughs> and, what, and what is predictable is that they grow exponentially. And I did talk about this yesterday, but I want to reinforce that because that's why, as Dana mentioned, my uh, the discussion of the future seems surprising to people because exponential growth is surprising. You start doubling little numbers and then suddenly you're doubling big numbers and it explodes. That's the nature, when you get to what I call the knee of the curve. That's the nature of exponential growth. And it's not intuitive. When we walked through the savannah a thousand years ago, we saw something coming at us in the corner of our eye. We made a linear prediction where that animal would be and that worked just fine. That became hardwired in our brains. Linear thinking is hardwired. And I have these discussions and debates with sophisticated 
scientist, uh, a neurologist, a neuroscientist uh, a while back who had felt he had modeled 1% of this phenomena in the past year. So this is going to take a century. Is it, nothing is going to happen in the next century to accelerate that work. And linear thinking is quite different than exponential thinking. If you take 30 steps linearly, you get to 30. If you take 30 steps exponentially, 2, 4, 8, 16, you get to a billion. This is not a theoretical conjecture about the future. This has already happened. When uh, the Prime Minister, uh, who was just a kid, uh, Didi, uh, some decades ago, and I went to MIT, we all shared a computer, and it cost tens of millions of dollars to have the building. And the computer in my pocket today is a billion times cheaper and a thousand times more powerful. That's a billion times more computation that you can buy, a billion times more bits of memory, a billion times more calculations uh, per shekel as when we were students. And the speed of exponential growth is actually speeding up. It took us three years to double the price of performance computing, 1900, two years in 1950, 12 months in the year 2000. It's now down to 11 months. But even just doubling every year, uh, 30 more doublings will, will multiply it again by a factor of a billion. And that makes qualitative changes in what we can do. And it's not just Moore's Law. You can tell it's Moore's Law. But Moore's Law says that you can shrink the size of components on an integrated circuit each year. So the components get smaller and you can put more on the chip and they run faster. Moore's Law was not the first paradigm to bring exponential growth to computing. It was the fifth paradigm. We've had exponential growth in computing decades before Gordon Moore was even born. And I'll show you these different uh, stages of, of exponential growth. And it's not just computers. It's not just the electronic gadgets that you carry around. It affects anything that has to do with information. So I mentioned biology yesterday. That was not an information technology just a few decades ago. We didn't have the genome. It was just the software of life. And as I mentioned, uh, that grew exponentially. And people were very skeptical that you could actually sequence the whole genome in 15 years when we had only done one ten thousandths of the genome in 1989. But it kept doubling and it got done on time. I saw the ARPANET, which is the predecessor to the internet, doubling every year in the early 80s. But it was a very tiny phenomenon. Nobody had heard of it. It tied together a few thousand scientists. But for various reasons, I felt that this would continue to double. Doubling every year ultimately makes a profound difference, a billion, in fact, a million in 20 years. So since the mid to late 1990s, this will be a worldwide web, I could use that term, connecting hundreds of millions of people to each other and to vast knowledge and resources. And people thought that was ridiculous. It was heavily criticized. Uh, and I didn't have a track record back then, so it was largely dismissed. But it happened right on schedule. So the chess computers doubling in power every year. Uh, that added 40 points to the chess score each year. So I did the calculation that, that meant that the computer would defeat the world chess champion in 1998. I made that prediction. That people thought that was absurd, but an average player could beat the best machines. Kasparov, the world champion, was asked about this in 1993. And he said, they'll never touch me. I've played the best chess machines in the world. They're brittle, pathetic, predictable. And that was a reasonable uh, perspective in 1993, they saw it passed in 1997, a year ahead of schedule. I try to be conservative sometimes. <laughs> and biology is a profoundly important field. I mean, Israel has uh, had the insight to really pursue what we call biotechnology, which is really to take this outdated software and reprogram it. We don't go very long without updating software on a cell phone. It updates the cell phone every few days. Uh, the software that we're walking around with is outdated. And we'd like to reprogram it. And right around the same time that we finished the general project, uh, new technologies to understand it and change it and reprogram it also emerged. RNA interference can turn genes off. New forms of gene therapy can add new genes. And there are thousands of projects basically take this outdated software and reprogram it to away from heart disease, away from cancer, away from aging processes. And there are many different methodologies there. I'm involved with a project with a company in the United States where we take cells out of the body, 
blood cells straight from out of the throat, add in a gene in vitro in a petri dish, so it doesn't trigger the immune system, which the old forms of gene therapy uh, had that problem. Uh, inspect it with a new type of microscope, multiply it a million fold, inject it back in the body, it goes back to the lungs, and this is cured fatal disease, pulmonary hypertension. It's undergoing even trials. And there are many other examples. Stem cells, there's a number of stem cell projects here at this conference, which are the basic progenitor cells that create all the different cells in our body, are being exploited for tissue regeneration so we can regrow our hearts. Uh, the President and I were talking about this pioneering Israeli uh, and Palestinian project to actually regrow uh, muscle tissue in the heart. Uh, there are many exciting projects like that. I'm uh, also involved in a project at MIT where we have identified the cancer stem cell, which is an important key to overcoming cancer. Uh, because chemotherapy wipes out cancer cells. That's like killing all the worker bees in a, a beehive. You need to get a queen bee, which is the cancer stem cell. This has been identified. We're actually growing them in a petri dish, and we found substances that kill the cancer stem cell. So without getting into the details, these technologies are information technologies now. That means they are growing in power by, by double every year. They'll be a million times more powerful in 20 years. It really will be a very different era in our ability to uh, overcome uh, disease and aging. So we consult with uh, Mr. Perez on the secrets to how to stay healthy uh, and vibrant for a few more decades, and by that time, we'll have these new technologies that we call the bridge to the bridge. And the second bridge we're bringing is the nanotechnology uh, revolution, where we're actually creating things that can go beyond biology, and I'll show you more about that. But th this was a surprising discovery. Uh, in my book, The Singularities Here, uh, that came out in 2005, we have all these different graphs. We have hundreds more in our laboratory. I have a group now of 10 people that help you gather data in many different fields. Uh, we just updated these graphs, and I'll show you updated graphs for the last five years. And people said, well, Ray, aren't you a little nervous? I mean, you don't control the future. Maybe the curve actually veered off this time. Maybe it didn't stay on track. And I said, well, I've done this now every few years for the last 30 years. I'm pretty comfortable with the continue. There are theoretical reasons why it should. And maybe we'll have some data problems. But indeed, it was, it's right on track, which is really pretty amazing when you consider how many factors affect these kinds of developments. And the, in, in the case of computation, this goes back to the 1890 American census. And so it went through thick and thin, through war and peace, through boom times and recessions, including the Great Depression. And a lot, a lot else happened in the 20th century, but none of it had any impact uh, on this basic trajectory. 